<laughs> Happy New Year! Um, I'm Shan. I'm Bert. Happy New Year. Yay! And we're doing our top 10 of 2018. Uh, <laughs> and um, so it was quite easy to pick, wasn't it? I think both of us. Yeah, it was easier than usual. So we've got 10 good ones. Really good ones. Okay. We love these books, didn't we? Yay. Yeah. Do we want to talk about any books we didn't like this year? It's up to, to you. It's your, it's your channel, sweetheart. <laughs> Did you have one that you didn't like? Um, well, my least favourite book of the year was um, Fire Sermon. <laughs> and my least favourite was Crudo by Olivia Lang, <laughs> which I gave one star. It's the only book I gave one star to mm. this year. Mm. I think I might have given Fire Sermon a very generous two stars. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Better than... I'm just Crudo. so kind, really. Yeah. I felt like I was being generous. And then the other book, which I didn't... It wasn't in my... It was not I didn't like it, but was... I didn't like as much as everyone else, was um, Educated by Tara Westover. And I was only mentioning it because, like, lots of end of year listing yeah. to have it on, and I just thought it was okay. Just acceptable. Acceptable. Yeah. I mean, a, a good effort. Yeah. Well yeah. Try, try hard the next time, yeah. maybe. So, would you like to start? So, we, are we, we're going from like 10 to the first. Yeah, I've made us put them in order. Yeah. So, we do a countdown. So, number 10. Number 10. Um, is We Are Okay by Nina LaCour. Yay! Which you read last year. It was and on I think my it top made your 10 top 10 last, last year. year. There's a few, I think, or at least two on my top 10 that made your top 10 last I year. Good books. Um, I love this. It's a young adult. Um, are they called contemporaries? Yeah. <laughs> Young adult contemporary. Um, yeah. It's just kind of a, a nice, quiet, quiet sort of small scale book about a girl that is grieving her grandfather and kind of also grieving this kind of lost relationship with her best friend um, that happened the previous summer. And she's in her dorm room at college and um, kind of it spends it passes the time over the sort of the winter break so she's kind of by herself and going through all this stuff and her friend comes up to visit her it's just a really sweet really moving um young adult isn't it it's like it's, it's a great book yeah it's good it's very yeah. um it's very quiet i think yes. it's sort of uh, um quite sort of confident in itself isn't it, it doesn't yeah. try and do too much yeah. it's I like the story's that. I quite like, slight. I like it when they don't feel they need to throw in loads of yeah. twists and like uh, you know tie things up yeah. crazily at the end. So yeah, I would recommend that to like anyone that's into young adult, but also just anyone at all because it's just really well written. Yeah. It's really sweet. Um, and I was really touched by it. I thought yeah. it was great. Yeah. And Nina Lacour is just gorgeous. Mm. <laughs> um, my oh. <laughs> facially and. And in personal and, and in spirit. spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My uh, number 10 is Princess Princess Ever After by Katie O'Neill, which is a graphic novel, which is kind of a little bit could be for kids, um, but I think works for anyone. And it's about um, Princess Sadie, who's locked up in a tower. And then this, I think it's Princess Amira, comes to um, save her. Although she's just like, oh, I don't want to, I don't need to be saved. And also Princess Sadie's a little bit chubby. And uh, the, 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 it deals with that. that. We like being a little bit chubby. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got a unicorn. Yeah. And an ogre. And an ogre. Yeah. It's so cute. Oh, should I show you some pictures? It's just the cutest thing ever. Look at that lovely picture of um, Sadie and a unicorn. The unicorn's mm. called Celeste. Mm. Oh, that's so that was delightful. Lovely. Number nine. Number nine. <laughs> Um, Love by Angela Carter. Um, it's got a beautiful cover. I love these vintage editions. This is very much a late 60s novel, I feel. I feel like it's... Um, I haven't read any other Angela Carters, and I know that she kind of went on to do lots of sort of feminist retellings of uh, like fairy tales and things like that, and I think this is just sort of pre the kind of massive onset of like that 70s feminist stuff but so um in some aspects it might be a bit dated and it's quite sort of hard going to read because it's very short but very intense but it has that really captures that um bohemian sort of um end of the 60s slight sort of degeneration of um like the ideals of the 60s and it's kind of about a uh 
love triangle. It's a girl and these um, a guy who she marries, and then his brother, who's kind of a little bit off the rails, um, comes in and lives with them, and it's kind of this kind of weird love triangle. Um, but I thought it was brilliant. It was really like um, uh, atmospheric, um, and I loved it. It was really good. Uh, my number nine, talking of 70s atmospheric, <laughs> is, the, <Link. laughs> is The Changeling by Karen Russell. So this is written in 1978 and then was reissued last year? 2017 or 2018? Uh, yeah, 2018. Recently, yeah. Yeah, um, and it's it's got this beautiful cover. It's um, a bit of a weird one. It's one of those things that what sticks with you more afterwards is the feeling of it. Mm. So it's got that slight... Not quite knowing what's going on, something's a bit off, but she's also the main character's a little bit drunk, so yeah, it it's just strange and yeah. eerie. I think if they're done really weird. well in those novels, like yeah. the, the mood novels are just really good, aren't they? Yes. So I feel like I need to reread it because the ending um I got a bit confused by it. Confused. You have to read this one. Yeah, I think I'd like that one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, number eight. Number eight. Beyond the Hollow <laughs> uh, um, by Barry Meltzberg. Um, I, this isn't a book that I would really expect people to go out and read. Um, I think if you're into kind of, I guess, sort of 70s countercultural sci fi, maybe like Kurt Vonnegut or Robert Silverberg, then you'd probably really love it. I think it's quite a downbeat um, science fiction novel. It's experimental and um, not. It's more about psychology and kind of um, trauma than, you know, space exploration and all that. Although this is about a Venus, uh, a trip to Venus and um, the consequences of what's happened there. Um, it's just really, really good. It's really interesting. Um, again, it might be a bit dated, but it's just so um, dark and interesting and original. It doesn't feel like anything else I've ever read. And I think if you're... Um, at all into that sort of era of that sort of counterculture-y kind of 70s sci-fi then I absolutely loved it I thought it was brilliant really did you good. read that with a book too before? no oh. no around the same time oh, okay yeah okay my number eight is 4321 by Paul Oster which is also my longest book I read this year at the longest book a th in, the, in world. the world yeah. at 1070 pages um I actually give it four stars but I think that all of uh, none of uh, Paul Oster's books are perfect. Yeah, they're kind in of a kind really of interesting in, way. Yeah, flawed, aren't they? yes. So also interestingly flawed, but um, I just felt like it was quite the masterpiece. I just thought, yeah, it, it kind of couldn't not be on the list because it felt quite epic mm -hmm. and um, clever and interesting and a little bit different. Um, you kind of know the story. It's like uh, he's telling this boy Archibald. Um, Isaac Ferguson he's telling his story but he's telling it on four sort of four different versions of his story so there's lots of similarities and then it kind of drifts off and goes in different directions um, it was fascinating uh, it's one of those things that you have to kind of just go with it because at the beginning again you're not really sure what's going on and then you just have to like you go with it and then it all kind of starts to make sense yeah. um, I love Paul Oster that's great I love him as well that's, we saw lots of um, interviews Oh this, yeah, um, yeah, and there's obviously lots about his life as well. I think. Yeah, I think like uh, has there been like a bit of a Paul Oster backlash? Almost like people were just kind of like I think people weren't of, interested in reading. A lot of people book, remember when it was on the um, Man Booker list. Mm. They didn't want to read it because it was like they were like, oh, it's some old Dude. guy. Yeah. Um, he's amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's and all of his novels are really similar in theme. Yeah, they? but I, I really find that interesting. But I wouldn't start here either because I yeah. just feel this is just too much of yeah. a. You'd yeah. start with one of his... Because yeah. all the other books he's written are quite short, aren't I they? I read um, Oracle Night this year, and that was brilliant. That was, um, like, early 2000s. Yeah. And, yeah, I thought that was, like, a really good starting place for a lot of people would be that one. Mm. It's maybe the favourite one of his that I've read as well. I like that so, one, too. Yeah. Okay, yeah. number... Seven. Seven. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. This is a, a proof copy, because it's not out yet. Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Taylor Jenkins Reid, I think... This year, um, her name was kind of quite sort <laughs> Can you of not remember the title around everywhere for the year. <laughs> Seven husbands. Husbands of Hugo. Hugo Cabray. Oh, yeah. 
No. No, that's the other one. Hugo. Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Hugo. <laughs> Here's a book that is out. Um, <laughs> Uh, this was so much fun. This is, uh, I think, Reese Witherspoon has is I'm kind of working on a, like TV a TV show, yeah, yeah, probably a Netflix thing yeah. for it. It's um, a kind of a made made up biopic of this um, made up seventies band called Daisy James and the Six, um, and it's all told in interviews by the remaining members of the band, sort of recalling their story, and. Um, I did not expect to. I kind of thought this is going to be like this is going to be trashy. I did not expect to have as much fun with this as I, <laughs> as I did. Um, yeah, Taylor Jenkins clearly knows the era and is like it's kind of a bit of a love letter to um, that sort of Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Nicks kind of seventies thing. It, was, it said it was like um, almost famous, isn't it? It is. Is that yeah? Yeah, yeah it is. And, and if you love almost famous, you would love this because it is that kind of fantasy of what being in a band. And like the whole story is great, and there's sort of you know um, love um, love triangles within the band. There's um, addiction, so it's and it's really good. It's like the the dialogue is, is really well done. All the characters are really um, fleshed out, um, but it's just like so much fun. It's it's just like such a good summer read maybe for like I think it's coming out in March. So yeah, yeah, I have to read that one. Um, my n next one is I will be complete by Glenn David Gold, which is a Christmas present from you, and which I talked about in my little haul recently. Um, it's quite a thick book, and I read it in... Well, I read it was sort of three days, but one of those days I was travelling all the way to Aberystwyth and was with my parents. That's so, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah, it's a memoir about his... Mainly it's about his relationship with his mother, and his mother is kind of a little bit strange. She start, they start up with lots of money, and then the mother loses the money and then it's also just about his his life as well but it's kind of always relating back to his mother um I thought it was great I thought it was funny as well in places even though there's kind of quite a bit of trauma mm -hmm. in it it was it was funny mm -hmm. too and um yes I was hooked it was a good find wasn't it yes yeah it's not one that I'd sort of seen anything about no anywhere. so but it sounded uh, yeah. interesting author of Carter Beats the Devil he yes. was also married to Alice Siebold who at um Lucky and what's the other one called? Lovely bones. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're divorced now. Yeah. They're divorced. <laughs> I felt a bit sad about that. <laughs> Number six. Number for you. six. Eve Babbitts. Yay. Slow days. Uh, fast company. The world, the flesh, and LA. Um, I kind of feel that any year that you read Eve Babbitts, it's going to get in the top ten. Oh, but I read when it didn't get in. Oh. Black Swans. Um, nearly would have got. I in mean, it was great, yeah. but it didn't quite um, make it. I think this is. I haven't read. I've read a few of hers, um, and I really loved this one. Yeah, um, I enjoyed that one. And it's yeah, it's nineteen seventies. It's kind of told as a series of small little chapters about boyfriends, like, and it's almost addressed to her current boyfriend, isn't okay. it? So it, like, she has a little introduction to each thing, saying you might want to skip this one. Or, okay, and they've um, all blurred into one. I'm afraid. Yeah, because they're all quite similar. Aren't they? Yeah, but her writing is what it's really. Yeah. about and she's really kind of funny and um almost that like it feels like you're at this like party and she's this like really interesting person who's just like telling you like yeah. stories and uh, well, she's so much fun yeah and a little bit she, drunk. i think yeah like disarming but also you don't realize actually what a good writer she is because it takes a lot of skill and craftsmanship to sound that um casual almost. Mm. um so she's like such a good sort of rediscovery, I think, Eve Babbitts. And this is something that I would recommend for anyone at all. Like, I would just put this in anyone's hand. And yeah, I think it's that. one that's like, it's really easy to read. So it's almost, you can just read it as something quite frothy, like a yeah. good summary. Yeah. But then actually it's got loads of depth to it as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And it's really funny. She's really, she's really funny. My next one is this one, How We Get Free, Black Feminism and the Combahee River Collective, edited by Kianga Yamata Taylor. It's a bit of a weird one for a top ten, maybe. Um, I found this one in a bookshop in Aberystwyth. Oh. <laughs> and it was, it's sort of interviews with these women, black feminists, to a queer black feminist from the 1960s and 70s. And it's interviews with them kind of more recently and talking about their work. But also they talk about how you, um, you we still need to do the work as well. And I just found it 
where sometimes these things can be, I guess, a bit depressing because yeah. there was so much, yeah. you know, it was really inspiring because there, there was someone, um, there's one woman who's more recent as well, who's kind of been involved with the Black Lives Matter. And it was just, yeah, an uplifting, inspiring. It's good that they've recontextualised it till yeah, now. It has that just being like yes. a, a social. <laughs> that was better, wasn't it? They recontextualised it for now. <laughs> What's your note? Number five. Top five. Yay. This is getting so exciting. I keep wanting to sing the Top of the Pops soundtrack. Yeah, you had that in your head for days for some reason. Top five. Number five. Um, Ride the Pink Horse. Dorothy B. Hughes. I'm not a big fan of this cover. No, it feels it like a like 90s, 90s attempt at doing crime Is it from 90s? No, it's from... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the cover oh, it's the... from the 90s. <laughs> it's 2002, so yes, oh, yeah. practically. <laughs> Um, yeah, originally um, published in 1946. So Dorothy B. Hughes is actually one of my favourites. She wrote um, In a Lonely Place, which is one of my favourite novels. Um, and this one was just as good. So good. I think there's a film. I've never seen it. Um, but yeah, so it's crime noir. It follows this um, guy called Sailor who goes into this American border town on the coast of Mexico, on the, uh, the border of Mexico. Um, just as this fiesta is starting and his plan is to try and get some money that he, feel he's, he, he feels that he's owed from this senator who he's been doing some kind of corruption work for. And the senator's kind of ignoring him. And it's this, this whole thing just plays out over these three days with this fiesta and then this um, detective comes in and it's like kind of these three characters kind of circling with this whole background of this uh, big sort of town having this kind of carnival. And it's just so good. It's like builds up the tension so well and you get into the minds of all three characters and like all of their kind of um, motivations and their sort of dreams for the future. And it's just kind of, yeah, it's just really well done in that you kind of, you get backgrounds of everyone. It's not just one of those sort of, this guy's bad, this guy's good, this is the policeman, this is the criminal. And it's just kind of really interesting psychological drama. And yeah, they just need to reiterate it with a nice... Kind of hard cover. I don't mind that cover. It's all right. My next one, number five, is The Miseducation of Cameron Post by Emily M. Danforth, um, which we saw the film for Love this year, film. Yeah. Um, which is why I read it, because you bought me this ages ago, and yeah. I hadn't read it, and so I read it before going to watch the film. Um, book and film were amazing, I thought. Mm. Book is really great. It's, um, you know, it's got much more to it than the film, because the film focuses on the last... Porter, really um I thought the book was just beautiful um really great writing it was it's quite it's slow mm. um you can just get really get involved in it um in case you don't know it's about this girl called camera post it's in the 90s and her parents just die suddenly in a car crash and she has to go and live with her auntie and then when her auntie finds out that she's gay she gets sent to like a gay conversion camp yeah. but that gay conversion camp is right towards the end and then um, when she gets there, it's weird, that, isn't it? yeah, the film just starts yeah. There. And when she gets there, it's not what I really liked about it, and we've talked about this as well. And what they do in the film that they don't just, um, it's not just saying it's all bad as well. Yeah. Whereas you know that obviously a gay conversion camp is bad, but they're not. You know they as they still show the decency kind of, of the people yeah. there, don't they? And, almost, they, well. they believe what they're doing, yeah, even though like they're actually in denial. Really, yeah. Aren't they? So I thought that was really good because it'd be so easy just to make it uh yeah you know these people the are evil the way, I've just seen you like the film, didn't the film you know? the book is beautiful yeah. um it's one as well that even though it's young adult that mm. i think it's a good adult read as well yeah doesn't particularly read young adult kind of number four is the piece of wild things by wendell berry which is uh actually a, a selected poems really it's um an overview of uh his kind of poetry like from when did he start writing? I don't know if it has dates for these poems. But Wendell Berry, yeah, so actually sort of mid 60s up till, you know, fairly recently. Um, Is he dead now? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think he might be. <laughs> Maybe. He's the, <laughs> the poet laureate of America's farmland. Yeah. So these were so still, clear, sort of precisely written poems that they were, and they're about like the land and farming really, but they're kind of, they're, they capture that, um, that moment of, that you might get in nature of just that, that stillness and where like a thought comes to you, you know, and they're just so, um, simple that they're almost like, um, almost like sort of Buddhist 
kind of um, what it, what's it called? Like uh, like like those little like Zen, like yeah, sort of proverby <laughs> kind of things, you know. Um, but they're but they're kind of all American, you know, very uh, seasony seasonal um, poems. I just I love them, you know. And I should read that. Yeah, I would like to read it, the individual collections, but as a kind of a gateway into it, this was really great. And yeah, the piece of wild things is like just beautiful. It's, you know, like um, uh, how's it go? Um, let's have a see if I can find it. There. Page twenty five. It's a short poem. I can read it. I can read it to you. you know. Read it to us, okay. Bert. This will just make you feel nice. Um, when despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Lovely. Yeah. My number four, is that what we're on? Yeah. Yep. Is Heavy by Kiese Lehman. Which you just read yesterday. Name. Yes. Yesterday and the day before. So I read this in two days. Um, lots of similarities to this because it's like a memoir about his mother. Yeah. Um, but really coming from, I guess, quite a different uh, angle or um, different backgrounds. Um it was it's whereas i was saying that the other one is quite funny there's there's no there's no funnies in here it's really serious um okay I see. <laughs> but he's so he is so great i am deep truth oh gosh mm. such deep truths mm. and i'm going to link the interview with him that i don't think you've watched but you started mm. watching with me where he he talks about trying to get this truth how you write truthfully and i think that is really difficult isn't it and um, yeah, because you're constantly second guessing. Yes, yeah. and also that thing because it's about his mother, and it's not flattering to his mother mm. in lots of places about how she had to agree to him publishing the book mm. as well, which she did, and she has also written a response to it. Okay. Which um, they talked about having this the last chapter, but then they decided not to, and it's just like a a, a blog post. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just that I guess that relationship with his mother that even though they've had such quite you know really hard time together that they've still the fact that they've had that conversation and that they've published this book i think is quite amazing mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. um he's a great writer i mm -hmm. uh hid yesterday away from the plumbers who came around and um <laughs> I the sat... we had the plumbers out, um, just I went to coffee. Have coffee so i could but i sat there having coffee hours. kind of reading it going <gasps> and i was just at home watching the sweeney yeah yeah <laughs> We're into the top three. Top three. Number three. What's but, number three? Oh but, my gosh, it's so exciting. Isn't it? Um, Strangers on a Train, Patricia Highsmith, which I did read for um, Booktubeathon this year. And um, yeah, I love Patricia Highsmith. I think she's like one of the great writers of the last century. I think she is such a great crafts uh, woman, crafts person, craft person, crafter. <laughs> um, she, and the, she manages to build up tension so well. And it's so claustrophobic and almost like funny that it's so difficult to read because it just makes you so anxious. Um, but so clever, so such good characters. We saw the film afterwards because I think I read it as the book to film adaptation yeah. part of uh, Booktube before. And the film was a bit of a letdown. Yeah. I think if, if I'd seen the I'm film by itself, I probably would have liked it because it's Hitchcock. Um, but after having read this, where it was like so much more depth and detail and the endings change in the film and lots of changes that just the book is so much better um yeah there's nothing much to say about this you probably know yeah. the story it's about like um these two strangers that meet on a train and um one of them comes up with this uh idea for the perfect murder which is if they each ki if they kill the other person's victim yeah. And they can't be tied to each other because they don't know each other. And how that all kind of unravels and goes along. Um, so good. So I don't feel we can have a top ten without no. having uh, Knife Scars on the list. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so it's the third year running where I've got a Knife Scar on here. Um, 
this is volume five, so Rain Must Fall. I was planning on reading volume six this year as well, but yes. I can read it next year and put it on next year's top ten yeah. instead. Um, this one, I just loved it. Same as the others. Same as the others. Yeah. Well, I think number three I wasn't as in love with. Mm. But I love this one. Um, it's when he is trying to write. So he's um, he goes on a writing course with John Foster, who I then ended up reading. Um, so there's lots about Norwegian writers. There's lots about his writing practice. Mm -hmm. There's his relationships as well. Mm -hmm. um, he listens to Boo Radley's in this <laughs> one. <laughs> there's lots about his really bad music taste. <laughs> There's more deep truths. Yeah. I think, you know, mm. he is... Is he married yet in this one? I can't remember what happens, because he... I don't think he's married... He's just faffing around, right? Yeah, yeah he has to... He got the relationship. I don't think he's married to his wife. Does he get married? I think he's gets married twice, so I can't remember yeah. now if he does marry the first wife in this mm. one. Um, but he's not with the wife that he ends up with having lots of children with, who I think mm. now are separated anyway. He was on his own and lonely to the depths of his soul. Oh my gosh. And what depths? Poor, poor Carl Oliver. Oh, there, isn't it? wonderful. Look at his face. <laughs> Number two. Number two. My second best read of the year was Cassandra at the Wedding. Yay! By Dorothy Baker. Uh, yeah. I've read that one too. Yeah, it's so good. It's about a... Um, these uh, kind of twin sisters and one of them is getting married and the other one who is the, the narrator of this book which is uh, Cassandra is um, traveling down to attend the wedding and she kind of is a disruptive influence really she's a little bit crazy yeah um, but she's just such a good character she's such a good narrator she's really funny isn't it's she? so funny it's very that kind sort of, in that sort of biting yeah it's that yeah. kind of salinger -y kind of yes. um, and it's the same era so it's early 60s I think 62 and it's just such a a voice a great a great voice novel and just one of those books that is just a timeless timeless classic yeah. that um yeah it just feels modern it kind of i feel like yeah if it, if it come out today it would feel like yeah that's still contemporary and yeah um i love that one as well it's so good yeah and it's it is really dark as well so you know like it has that sort of um light and dark it has kind of that sort of fizzy kind of feel to it but it has um, a really underlying kind of quite harrowing aspect to it especially towards the end um, and it's the balance is just done so well um, I really loved it it's become one of my favourites got a quote by Carson McCullers on the back it says I whose usual bedtime is 10 o'clock stayed up all night reading that exquisite Cassandra at the wedding dazzled by the pyrotechnics of such an artist yeah that says it all yeah, yeah. my favourite story about Carson McCullers is her and uh, oh, Marilyn Monroe. Monroe drinking together in New York they used to hang out in a hotel lobby and maybe she'd been out drinking with Marilyn before that. And then yeah, it was around um, that. Yeah, yeah. I would have thought so. Yeah. How great. <laughs> Number two for me is Lit by Mary Carr, which I know I talked about a lot because it was one on our on my top Cause you're obsessed. ten. Because I was obsessed. Yeah. It kind of made me um well, I can't let you it made me really interested in her just in general as a person. Yeah. And followed her on Twitter and we complain had, to we people had, who it, talked about David Foster Wallace without talking about Mary Carr. Yeah, what are you doing, guys? <laughs> um, we had the Mary Carr. Like, Cherry, was it Cherry? We had that for, like, ten years. Yes. And it just, it's still sat in me. I haven't still read because yeah. it's the, well, also because it's the second. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, okay. so I haven't got the first. Right. So Liar's Club is the first. Right. Is this and the it, third, then? This is the third. Well, that's no excuse for not reading the no, second. No, but I didn't realise, mm. I don't think. Mm. Oh, I think it was, like, because it was Wiener Wonders the book on booktube who mm. kept talking about how great it was right, yeah, yeah. and it made me want to read it yeah. and it's it is just that so it's about her it's a memoir it's about her drinking mm. it's about her writing with it's so the great title of lit mm. um it's about her, it is it touch on a relationship with D david foster wallace mm -mm. you're all about the, all about the deep truths this year isn't <laughs> deep truth and lots scars, of memoirs yeah Deep Truth 2018 was the year of Deep Truth. So. <laughs> My next one is Deep Truth I mean, as well. Not for me. So. <laughs> no, you almost are just frothy. <laughs> yeah. What's number one, number Bobby? One, Black Wave Whoa. by Michelle T. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, Eileen Miles and Maggie Nelson are all raving about it on the back. It's made your top ten last yeah. year. Is that MT for MD? What I think it is. Yeah, I, I, Matt Dillon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Michelle T for Matt Dillon. <laughs> This um, was just so great, and I love Michelle T, and we've both kind of just loved Michelle T for yeah. so long. Um, and it almost starts like 
a throwback to those early Michelle T novels as like it so the you know protagonist is like this lesbian in San Francisco who's you know slightly sort of drug addicted alcoholic poet in um, the 90s in the 90s uh, and it's kind of like oh this is familiar ground but I'm happy with this and it's great because she's a great writer and it's that kind of almost that beat style of writing but but 90s um but then it it's kind of gradually starts throwing in these details where like you know the about the climate and about sort of certain foods being scarce and you realize that it's actually a kind of apocalypse novel with this bit in the middle about her trying to write the novel which like breaks it all down and she's like thinking why am i writing this novel about yeah. another like you know another novel that was like lesbian in san francisco in the 90s and then she kind of considers writing it about like some white guy yeah and and then it goes back to the story and it's, it's like becomes this whole other story and it's just so interesting so Especially well matt done Dillon. with matt Dillon. she yeah and it's almost like how a lot of um uh dystopian or apocalyptic novels are quite masculine i think they're they're all about kind of you know survival and um and this kind of just flips it around in that the character that she was at the beginning is actually like she's kind of improved yeah by by the, the end of the world because she like starts working in this bookshop she uh sleeps with matt dillon she, <laughs> that spoilers, she, it. <laughs> she goes she goes she becomes sober and it's I, like, that, it's like, that bit about her being sober yeah. really stuck out for me because she does come out of character and returns to narrate narrator yeah and says um if kind of says if you want to get sober i'm kind of glossing over it here she says mm. in the book but if you want to get sober you've got to go to aa and it kind of and i, <laughs> yeah. I really like that it was yeah. just like you you can't just yeah. you know don't just follow novels where it looks like it's really easy you've got yeah. to go and yeah and i thought that was good yeah it's just a really smart novel it's kind of yeah. felt like a really modern but not like one of those kind of dated meta kind of things but it felt like a new approach in that yeah. it was like it was it wasn't what really you thought it was going to be because it was her trying to write this honest novel but then writing about her writing like this deep novel truths. Honest... yeah deep truths <laughs> and black wave and my number one of the year is mean by miriam gerber which is also one that you bought for me i did so well you did really well um oh i really like this mm. and i've become a bit obsessed with miriam gerber as well um it's a memoir but kind of quite it almost reads like a, a, a novel it's got some sort of stuff you know really short sections it's like richard brotigan kind of. yeah and it has um it's just sort of talking about just her everyday life i guess but then there's um uh, sexual violence um which is obviously awful so it, it talk, then kind of talks about that as well um yes i don't know what else to say it's just a little bit different as mm -hmm. well it was really amazing writing mm -hmm. um it's really short but it's just so so good number one number one did we make the number ones yes <laughs> so that's it that's the top 10 i don't know if that video went on forever i think it was a good one yeah, I don't know if it was a bit dull. No, it wasn't. <laughs> okay, happy new year. Happy See you new soon. Year. Bye. 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 <laughs>